All right, greetings everyone. Good afternoon, good week, good new semester. Um, this is the first intro video for the spring semester of uh, the rhetorical tradition, Communication Studies 409. And um, just want to do what we always do in the first day of class, which is just kind of walk through the syllabus, talk about the class, uh, offer some, hopefully some useful suggestions, um, just kind of talk through where I'm coming from and what to expect over the next 15 weeks or so. So uh, welcome to 409, welcome to the rhetorical tradition. This is a class that I have taught now for many, many years in different kinds of iterations. When I first took this job many years ago, I did a mass lecture version of this class, although it was at a, a lower level, but it was like 120 students all in this big auditorium. It's kind of weird to think how far things have changed because now I teach it in front of <laughs> screens for the most part. Um, and uh, despite all of that, the, the course has re remained largely the same, although the last few weeks do tend to change in terms of the stuff that's happened over the last few decades and, and the kind of emphases there. But yeah, this is a class I've taught for quite a while. Um, and. You know, I, I trained with Tom Conley, who is a rhetorical historian and classicist, and so I have some, you know, decent amount of training, I think, in this material. Um, and this is my best attempt to smash down and, and compress, what, 25 plus 100 years of human social, cultural, political history, communication history, and try to tell a story about the rhetorical tradition that does justice to that tradition while also not overwhelming students and also hopefully making the material relevant and illuminating um, the ways that we live today still asking many of these same questions engaging in many of these same kind of practices um, and so the, the course is really kind of structured around like themes and patterns um, and we'll see kind of where we're at today and, and we seem to be going through some interesting kind of changes um, not unlike some other moments in the history. So I do still think that, you know, reading history and being familiar with history is very useful because, you know, we are in a time of wild, rapid change. Um, and a lot of it feels brand new. But a lot of this stuff that we're going through, I think, that has like precursors and ways of kind of like shedding light on what we're going through. Um, and the comments that I've received from students recently in this class is like when we've been going through Plato is like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that this stuff still kind of matters and is relevant and the kind of questions we ask about how we live together and how we live together better and how we can aspire or how we can guard against um, uh, deception and so on. All right, so this is a class in rhetoric where it came from, the different kinds of directions that it has gone and I isolate kind of four major directions. Um, I call those the four main models of rhetoric. We're going to be doing that uh, right away this week, I believe. Um, and then we sort of use those models to, to, to jump through key moments in the history, thinking about major texts, major moments, um, major developments and transformations. And then, of course, trying to get up to the 20th century, which is the stuff most of us are familiar with, and then focusing more on like what's been going on in the last few decades. Um, I actually do have another class that I created a while back on contemporary rhetorical theory. I haven't taught that one in a while, but obviously that's focusing more on like the last few weeks of this class. Um, and uh, maybe I'll get a chance to do that again at some point. For now, we just kind of spent a little bit of time on, on the present moment. but. In the context of the whole history, um, I think it should bo be both kind of interesting and new and familiar. Okay, so just going to quickly walk through this syllabus here that's posted now on the website and um, just kind of give you a sense of, of the class and what's coming. Um, so that's the first thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to like familiar yourself obviously with the syllabus and then and this video and then start moving into the introductory stuff in Herrick. This is the book that we're going to be using, the James Herrick book right here, 6th edition. Um, some of you will uh, might be asking the question of can I use an earlier edition or a different edition? Um, the blanket answer there is you can, but I can't guarantee that you know, your coverage will be the same as our coverage, where it needs to be the same, right? And so there can be bits and pieces 
that are in this book that are not in your book and then you've lost out. Um, and so there's always that caution. So if you do have a different edition because someone gave it to you or, I don't know, you got it cheap or whatever, maybe just try to like buddy up with someone who has the sixth edition so you can just make sure that you're getting everything you need. Um, aside from this book, everything else content-wise will be and already is in the Canvas page. And I guess I'll just um, start talking about the kind of the structure of the class. Um, the first page, you can read through all that stuff. We got the book. I'll talk about the assignments in a minute. But we have these three modules that are listed on the bottom of the first page here. So we've got kind of three major content areas for this class. One is ancient Greek and Roman rhetorics. That's like a really super important period because that's where like these ideas originally kind of were formulated and a lot of activity around rhetoric in that ancient world. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff in between, but we probably want to spend a little bit of time on the kind of re late Renaissance, early modern period because there's some interesting twists that happen there. And then we're going to jump into like the 20th century when there's another big set of twists and turns and some interesting stuff there. Um, so just the three modules or the three kind of content units. Uh, we used to spend a lot more time in that second one. In fact, I might have even had four units back in the day. But I'm just trying to like simplify the content as we go along here. So just two weeks in that Renaissance early modern period. Um, and then that's going to get folded in with the, the third unit on contemporary, late modern contemporary stuff in terms of like the second test. Um, so second page lists uh, the assignments, which I'll get back to in a sec. Um, grading scale, again, the assignments. What I want to look at here is the, the, the schedule. All right, so this is on page four, and I just want to kind of explain the kind of relationship between the syllabus and Canvas, right? So if you hold the syllabus up against your screen while you have the Canvas page pulled up, there should be a pretty close um, correspondence between what you're seeing on the syllabus and then the flow of stuff on the, on the Canvas page. So it looks very similar, right? So you've got like the first unit in all of the, the content and it flows just in the same order as it does in the syllabus, and then you've got another module or unit or whatever, and then the third one. So everything's on that kind of first home page. Um, so it does look like the syllabus. And, and the idea here is like you look in your syllabus, so for this week we've got course overview introductions, and we've got the four main models of rhetoric, and we've got Herrick. All right, so obviously you're gonna watch this video, the intro hello video, and then go and um, I would recommend that you read the first chapter in Herrick just to kind of get your get your juices flowing in terms of some of the ideas and some of the kind of the basic stuff. Um, and then go see what else is in Canvas in terms of this content. Um, I don't list the lecture videos in the syllabus. There are lecture videos that are that correspond with each week of content, right? And so there's a video on the Form A models. Um, next week, we're going to move into sophistry. So there's Herrick chapter two. There is a, a selection by Hannah Arendt, this really interesting sort of ancient distinction between the private sphere and the public sphere, which will really help us, I think, understand kind of what goes on in this kind of traditional realm of rhetoric or the, re the political realm or the public realm, and how is that distinct from other things? This distinction no longer holds for us today, but it's a useful way to think about kind of where rhetoric came from and what it was kind of about and then we can compare that where we are today. So we've got Arendt, Gorgias' Encomium of Helen, and we've got a short reading called Disoi Logoi, right? And so the readings are going to be available. The non herrick readings will be available, just listed on the page there. And any corresponding videos will also be listed there. And sometimes I add even some additional stuff, supplementary stuff, right? Just examples, maybe additional video, a little side reading or whatever. That's just meant to like... I don't know, illustrate some ideas for you. Like in the Isocrates week, week uh, five there, I threw up a video on Obama, President Obama, as an example of an Isocratean orator, right? And so that's just meant to like give you something to maybe think about as a, in a concrete sense. But it should work, and I haven't had too many issues with students complaining about uh, not being able to kind of follow along, but it should work quite smoothly, right? So for each week, you look in the syllabus, you see what's there. The, the content is organized by week on the, on the Canvas page and just kind of work through the content, right? So my suggestion would be start with Herrick. If there's a Herrick selection or an entire chapter, do that. 
then uh, usually there's some kind of notes or maybe some kind of a supplement. So work through those notes. Watch the lecture video. Those are going to be important because this is the, the equivalent, essentially, of me being in a classroom, standing up in front and just sort of like walking through the day's lesson, focusing on the key ideas, the key concepts and terms and themes, trying to explain some of the maybe the weirder kind of twists and turns, right? And so the lecture videos are, I think, probably one of the most important bits of content because it's where I'm drawing connections between all the other bits and pieces, right? So... Basically, each week you've got a bit of reading and you've got some lecture videos that, again, are trying to kind of replicate what we would be doing in a classroom. We're not doing synchronized meetings because no one really seems to be happy with synchronized meetings. So we're doing the asynchronous route, but I'm still giving you me lecturing, essentially, in these videos. At the top of our Canvas page, I have linked my own YouTube page where you can have access to all of these videos and more. So I have my other classes. I created the YouTube page a number of years ago, even before remote stuff became really hot and well before the pandemic. We're going back to like mid-early 2000s, around 2007, 8, I think. My ex at the time was living out in uh, Missouri. And so I would go out to be with her in the summers and I would still be able to teach my classes remotely. And I started just recording myself talking to my students through YouTube and it just kind of grew from there right and so when the pandemic came along I already had this channel I already had this kind of system for recording videos and it worked really well I think in terms of being able to um, send to my students to my classes some version of me talking about the material and, and trying to communicate uh, where I'm coming from and, and trying to emphasize the stuff that, that I think is worth um, focusing on. So hopefully this works for you. Hopefully you get this sense of the flow of things. And um, and that's pretty much what we will be doing. So I just arrange things by week. So every week you know what you need to do. It's not by day. It's not by, you know, whatever. It's just like, here, all right. So this week we're covering this stuff. Now this is where I need to move into the like caution, reminder, suggestion, tips and tricks for success, right? This is the part, the part of this video where if you want to do well in this class or however you want to do in this class, here's what I would really strongly recommend in terms of how you approach the class and how you organize yourself in relation to it, right? So like I said, each week you have, you know, this amount of content, a couple of readings, a lecture video, that's about it usually. Um, the assumption, my assumption is, is that everyone is doing that, right? So each week you're seeing what you need to read, you're seeing what you need to do, and you're just doing it. You're, maybe you're sitting down for a chunk of time, maybe two hours one day a week, or maybe you chop it up into one or maybe three one-hour sessions. Whatever works best for you, I leave that up to you, right? Um, the whole thing about this remote learning business is that we do have tons of freedom and independence, and I like that a lot, personally. I like that a lot. Um, but I have found that with that extra kind of roominess and that independence comes a lot more, oops, I forgot. Or, oh my goodness, I can't believe that's actually due. Oh my goodness, right? So I'm going to plead with you, with everyone right now, to, if you don't have a calendar, get a calendar or whatever system you need to use to like, get down the dates specifically of the test. We only have two tests. There's a midterm and a final. Please make sure that those are on your calendar, that you know when they're coming up. The dates are on the second or third page, I think. Right, so the midterm is March 8th, and the final is May 10th. Um, I'll talk about the papers a little bit more in a sec. But right, those two dates are super important. When we have tests, I don't do the thing... I have tried to do this thing, but it's just easier to do. To I have tried to do the thing of like the the, the final exam scheduled for this two hour chunk of time. So that is when we are all going to sit down at our computers and take this test. Too many variables, too many moving pieces, too many. I didn't make it. This went wrong. That went wrong. So now I just make it available for the whole day. So starting at eleven or sorry twelve o one a.m. When's the first one? March March eighth. Right, So as soon as March 8th becomes March 8th, which is effectively the night before, right, 12.01 a.m., right after midnight, you can take that test. So if you're a late night person, if you want to take it at the end of your day, if you end up staying up till 1, 2 in the morning or whatever and you're still awake and you want to do that, I remember those days a little bit, 
way back, right, doing work at midnight and beyond, go for it. Or if you're an early riser, you can get up at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. You can take care of it before you do anything else. Or you can just devote a chunk of time throughout your day. But anyway, you have 24 hours to take those tests. All I ask is please just make sure that you clear your schedule, don't travel, don't book something on that day, or if you do, at least make sure that you've carved out that chunk of time. Give yourself two hours, right? Now, the midterm isn't, I think the midterm is 75 minutes, but it's close enough. Give yourself two hour chunk of time to deal those tests and you'll be fine. That's all I ask. Um, I try very hard to work with all my students in terms of like life gets in the way, things happen, I missed this or I couldn't make it or technology or whatever. But in the last couple of semesters, those issues have, have seemed to have like um, grown exponentially, right? So this last semester, I had a whole bunch of students and all kinds of, of problems in terms of assignments and deadlines. And it was just constant, constant, you know, emails about, oops, I missed and can I still and... So please, I will do my best to work with you in terms of flexibility, in terms of like lateness, but please try your very best to make those times, get them in your calendar, know what's coming. All right, so in terms of the papers, we only have four assignments in this class. We have two tests and two papers. The first paper is due on February the 26th, so we, we don't have anything due in this class for almost two months. Um, and then the next paper, the second paper is due toward the end of the semester. And the whole point of these papers and tests is to hopefully get students good with the concepts. This class is really concept driven. Concepts like topoi, like invention, like style, like delivery, like kairos, like doxa, like arrangement, like power, like status, like identification, so many concepts. For me, that's really what the whole kind of thing boils down to is these key concepts, these key terms, and how those things evolve and change and how they help us sort of approach this practice of rhetoric, okay? So the papers are meant to exercise your critical usage of the concepts by analyzing some text. It's usually a movie or a TV episode or something like that. And then tests are really trying to explore your comprehension and understanding of those con of those concepts. That's really kind of the 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 crux of what I'm up to here. Um, so just the four assignments. Please, 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 please note those due dates. Please be anticipating when things are coming up. When the test is coming up, I try to give you a little extra time for like getting caught up on readings and reaching out and in, in terms of like if you have questions or whatever. Um, so, you know, all I'm going to ask is, you know, if you want to do well in this class, the, one of the number one things that you need is organization. And then the second and related thing would be independent, you know, working uh, uh, abilities, mindset, right? So being able to work independently, being able to look when things are due and when things are coming up and just take care of them. Here's the main thing with this second point. And again, I'm gonna plea, I'm gonna actually plea with you to take this seriously. All right, so as I think I wrote somewhere on the syllabus, some of these readings will, will be challenging, I think. There will be new, weird, some of the language will be different. You might not understand, you might get frustrated, you might get confused. At that point, please reach out to me and come see me. I'm gonna, I'm going to be in my office uh, most of the day on Wednesday. I teach my grad seminar on Wednesdays at 2.30. So I'm going to come in in the morning, and I'm going to have office hours uh, for all my classes from, I think it's 10 to 1. And I really do encourage you to come see me, if, especially if you have questions about the material. Here's what I've noticed over the last year or so. Coming out of the pandemic, everyone becoming more kind of comfortable and normalized around remote education, remote learning, remote courses. Um, first of all, I'll say like, I am someone who also really enjoys working remotely, right? And so here I am in my office, my casita at home, I'm wearing sweatpants, <laughs> it's, it's comfortable. As soon as I'm done this, I'm gonna probably go make myself a smoothie. Who doesn't love that? Also, who doesn't wanna, who wants to deal with traffic, you know, coming to campus? I, before the pandemic, I would go to, go to the campus, go to the office like three, four, five days a week, right? And I remember two things. I remember hating dealing with the traffic because I'm a good 35, 40 minutes away from campus. But I also remember a more robust campus culture and a more robust departmental culture 
and college culture. We're in the Urban Affairs College, obviously. And the truth is that I prefer to be at home. I prefer to just get up, have my coffee, come out here to my office and get my work done. I don't want to have to go to campus if I can avoid it. But I'm also realizing that I'm losing out. I'm losing out on conversations with my colleagues. I'm losing out on conversations with students. I feel like I don't even know my undergraduate students anymore. I used to know so many undergrads. We would be friends and besties, and I would write letters for them. And when I wrote letters for them, I would actually have an image of their face in my head because I had met them and I had known them. This weird thing has happened over the last year or so where I get asked to write letters for people I've never actually met. I don't even know. I have never seen them before. That's a weird thing, right? And so I am torn and I'm split because I much prefer the, you know, just be at home thing. But I also am realizing how much we're losing by not coming to campus and having conversations with each other. And I have been asking students to come into my office hours and chat with me. Just in any case, just come by and say, hi, I swear I would love to meet you. I would love to chat with you, get to know you a little bit. I love it when students come by just to sort of say, hey, I thought, you know, I saw you from the videos. I just want to say hi. And oh, you talked about that movie or that restaurant or whatever. Like, I love that or I hate that or whatever, right? But especially, 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 if you start to have struggles with the readings and the course content and the material, that is not the time to pull away. That is not the time to, you know, start talking with your fellow students. Maybe there's someone who can help you, but please just come to your instructor. This is what I get paid to do is to try to help work through ideas, work through questions and problems. It's, it's frankly the best part of the job that I don't really get to do anymore. I haven't taught an undergraduate class in person in, in three plus years. And I miss my conversations with my undergraduate students because all I do now is I throw everything up online and then I just answer emails. And usually the emails are like problems or like situations that we've got to resolve. But I don't get the juice. The juice is the conversation about rhetoric and about content, concepts and ideas and like what's going on in the world and what do you think and you know. So please, I'm begging you, come by and see me. Come to my office hours. Come ask questions about the readings. Come share your frustrations. I have been doing this for quite a while now. I hope I can explain concepts. I hope I can make these ideas more simple and clear and relevant to you. I'm going on about this because, you know, I had so many students last semester and I never saw anyone. I mean, one or two came by my office at one point. But I would go into my office hours each week and I just would sit there and no one would come. And I just feel like I miss my students. I miss my undergrads in particular because I still, you know, interact with grad students because they have offices in our hallways. But I do miss my undergraduates. I really miss our conversations. Um, and I, I enjoy having conversations about more than just, you know, can this paper be one page less or what's the formatting style or... Oops, I uploaded the wrong paper. Can you reopen it? Like, all that stuff's necessary. I get that. But, like, the joy of the teaching is talking about rhetoric with my students and, and fielding their questions and even fielding their frustrations. I understand that rhetoric can be a little challenging. But I, I, I do this and I teach this class in the way that I teach it by going way back to the beginning because I do believe that, like, this old stuff that might seem completely irrelevant is still relevant and still it can guide and illuminate the concepts, the questions, the problems, there's so many still that are like playing out today. So I don't teach this because I'm some kind of weird history nerd. I don't care about history for history's sake. I care about history for what it can help us understand and, and do maybe a little bit better or remember that we've been here before kind of thing, you know? Um, gosh, it's getting long already. So I don't want to, you know, belabor that point too much. I just... I just really miss the conversations with students and I feel also like that we can get a lot of progress done. You know, I get a lot of requests for bonus point assignments or extra credit type assignments and I feel like that all that stuff wouldn't be necessary if you could if you came in if we talked and if we kind of got you back on track, right? And especially come in and see me and chat with me before the assignments, before the test. If you have questions about the test, come and see me beforehand. Get you squared away. Or the test or the sorry, the papers. Come chat about your ideas for the paper. See if you're on the right track. And then go submit the paper when you feel more confident. Let's take the guesswork out of this. You know what I mean? All right. So this is already plenty long. I'll have to edit this down a bit. But uh, I just wanted to like hit those key points. Um, you have a lot of independence and a lot of flexibility. Only four assignments for this entire class. So therefore, each assignment matters a lot. 
please prepare, give yourself enough time. I've given you lots of time, right? The, the papers, I'm going to open them up really soon. And frankly, you can submit them or once you've worked through the materials, go ahead and submit the paper whenever you're ready. I do have a deadline. This is the end. This is the, this is the last point that you can submit this paper, but you're welcome to do it whenever you feel ready if it's done. But the tests are what they are. They're going to be those one day, you know, sort of one day long sessions. Um, and then my hope is that you will be, you know, thinking ahead and planning ahead and, and preparing ahead. And that if you do have questions and frustrations, you know, a week out, five days out, come see me. It's like, okay, I've been working through this kind of stuff. I have these questions and we will talk and it'll be brilliant. All right. So that's about it. I think I'm, I'm trying to think if I've missed anything obvious or big here. Um, so aside from this video, all the other videos have been recorded in previous semesters. Some go back a number of years. The content, I still stand by the content. Um, but uh, I'll, I might look a little bit different, a little bit older, a little bit younger, whatever. So this is just me kind of like fresh, start of the semester saying hello. I'll, I'll send out an email as well just to kind of like, you know, say hi to everyone. But other than that, you're on your own. You're, you're off. You're, you know, you're, you have the materials. You have your roadmap, which is the syllabus, and you have all the content. So it's just a matter of working through that. Again, work independently, be deliberate, be intentional, be organized, and reach out as soon as the issues occur, and then we will all be golden. All right? I wish everyone well. It was crazy rain and hail earlier. Crazy times we're in right now, man. Um, let's have a great semester. It's the spring. Uh, I feel like life's starting to come back to normal a little bit. The pandemic seems like it's kind of in the rear view, which is yay. We still have some things we got to deal with and work through, but like, life proceeds, right? So hope everyone's well. Looking forward to meeting you. Do reach out. Don't be a stranger. And let's have a great semester. All right. Peace.